Hi, welcome back to this video series on cryptography. In this segment, I'm going to talk about Feistel network. We talked about Feistel network uh, in the previous segment as well, but I wanted to demonstrate one particular problem related to the number of rounds. So in particular, I wanted to show to you that if the number of rounds is set to two, uh, the Feistel network is not secure, okay? Remember the goal of the Feistel network is to construct a pseudo-random permutation from a pseudo-random function. And I'm going to show to you that if I only do two rounds of Feistel network, then uh, my resulting ciphertext uh, reveals information about plain text, okay? I'm going to demonstrate that. More precisely, if I, if I have uh, two uh, plain texts, I can um, see the patterns in the ciphertext. Uh, more dangerous in the sense that if I have two ciphertexts, I can XOR them to get portions of plain text. That's what I'm going to show to you. So um, let's see. Suppose uh, we have a Feistel network like this. Let me draw only two rounds because that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we split the data into two parts, right? This is our raw data that we would like to encrypt, okay? So we split it into two halves. We call it L0 and R0 equal halves. If you are talking about a modern block cipher, usually it's 128 bit. That means this, this is 16, overall 16 bytes, right? You have a, um, um, eight bytes here and another eight bytes here, right? Okay, it's totally 16 bytes, making it to 128 bit block cipher, okay? So this is how we split the data into two parts. The first thing we are going to do is we feed this uh, into an XOR gate, right? Which needs two inputs. The next input is coming from the pseudorandom function. We call a pseudorandom function f using key k1, right? And we feed r0 uh, into the input uh, for fk, the pseudorandom function. It produces some random number. That's the definition of a pseudorandom function. Um, then we take that and uh, we exchange this like this way. So the next round is, this is L1, this is R1, right? Okay. And we do the same now. We send this L1 to the XR gate, right? Uh, we send the, let me draw like this way. We send the R1 to uh, F, uh, the pseudo function F, but we use a different key, K2. Um, in practice, from one key, we derive multiple keys. So we have K and we use some key, key, key scheduling algorithm or a key derivation algorithm, something like that to derive a bunch of keys, okay? So imagine we have such a way to derive a bunch of keys. And now, this, this is going to repeat one more time to the second round, right? What we will do is this is going to be L2 R2. This is the output of the first round. Um, okay, here is the data. Here is the first round. Here is the second round, okay? So we can now stop. Let's see what happens if we stop, stop here. What is the problem? Is this secure? First of all, if you have a piece of plain text, um, the exact copy of the plain text gets copied uh, as part of the L1, right? Because L1 is just a copy of R0. So if you stop here, it will be very bad because we will be leaking all the bytes, all the eight bytes of um, R0, which is bad, which is because it's plain text. Um, R1 is gibberish because R1 is coming from L0 XR with the random key. Right, that, that means R1 is gibberish, that's good. What about L2, is L2 gibberish? L2 is just a copy of R1, therefore L2 is also gibberish. Uh, is R2 gibberish? Yes, because it's XR with a, a key, a random key, therefore R2, L2 by definition will not leak anything about L0 or R0, but that doesn't mean it's secure, okay? So consider this scenario now. Suppose you have another data set, okay? Here is one data, D. And you have another block, uh, block say D2, okay? Think about, think about the, the structure now. Suppose I have another block, for whatever reason, the same eight, by, uh, eight bytes here, but instead of L0, let's say we have uh, something else, some, some data, news data, say L, L0 prime. Now, of course, if you just run this uh, Feistel network on this input, you will get some gibberish out, but there's a connection between these two. Okay, let's, let's, let, let me um, say you, you, you managed to draw this what you will be getting is L2 prime and R2 prime, right? That's, that's what you will be getting out as part of the, if you run the Feistel network on this input, okay? So here is your uh, output from the second Feistel network. This is the output from the first, this is first and this is second. But there is a connection between these two outputs, 
Okay, I'm going to show to you that connection. Um, that's my next step. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of write the uh, mathematical syntax um, and, and derive uh, the problem. Okay, and I'll show to you how you can um, decrypt um, such a Faisal network outputs. Okay, so let's let's talk about the left hand side network first. Um, all we did is basically um, L2, the, the left half of the first cipher, the first uh, box cipher uh, run through. Okay, we know L2 is same as R1. That's how Python network is defined. What is the next thing we're going to do? Um, R2 is same as, how did we get R2? We get R2 from L1. I'm going to use this cap symbol for XR. F of, we encrypt this using R1. This is how we got this. But how did we get R1? We get R1 by taking a, um, um, R0, right? Yeah, no, not R0. We take a, a L0, XR it with FK1 of R0, okay? Which means we can rewrite this whole thing as follows right we can rewrite as the output of the first network is what is the output of the first network we have pairs l2 r2 right l2 r2 and we will be rewriting everything in terms of l0 r0 because that's how we started at the beginning which means uh, i would say let's call it c as a cipher text for the first one it will be same as um, l0 because we are now filling L2, right? L0 XR with FK of one or zero. And then um, the next part is, I put the two parallel lines to denote concatenation, okay? This is R2 part. R2 part is uh, L1, which is, uh, how did we get L1? L1 is same as R0. So R0 um, XR with uh, F of K2, um, again, L0, uh, XR with F of K1 or zero. Okay, that's a lot of uh, XRs, but anyway, <laughs> um, I hope I had all the brackets lined up correctly. One, two, three, one, two, three. Seems, oh, no. one, two, three, four, one, two, three. I need one more. Okay, all right. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter, but, but you see here, this is the left part. And this is the right part for the first network. Okay, this is the first network. But if you do the same for the second network, as you can see, the problem is this part, right? It just says L0 is XR with K1 or zero, okay? What about the second network? If you do the same for the second network, let's call it C2 is the output of the second network. It will be, L, instead of L0, it will be L0 prime. Okay, left hand of the, um, I need to use a prime, okay. XR with, everything is the same except L0 replaced by, L0 is replaced by prime, okay. That's it. Okay, now how can somebody break this? Suppose somebody gets access to L as <coughs> ciphertext C and ciphertext C2, how can they break the system and find more about the plain text L0 or 0 or L0 prime? How do they find out? If you not pay close attention to this portion, this is an interesting portion. Take the first half of the output, meaning uh, from the ciphertext, just take the first half of the first ciphertext and do the same for the second ciphertext. Okay, so we don't need to worry about this part because this is different, right? Because this is L0 prime, therefore this whole thing is going to be uh, gibberish, okay? So let's uh, make it simple. Let's get rid of this part because we're not interested in it for a moment. Um, so I'm going to remove this. Okay, and I'm also going to remove this because it's just the second half is not interesting. But now it becomes more interesting for me. Suppose you do XR of both the ciphertext C and C2. What will happen is that we get XR of the plain text messages and this is bad. This is bad because suppose you know a little bit about L0, you can find L0 prime as well because this is public. Even if you don't know anything about L0, um, there are techniques to learn about L0 or L0 prime from 
the uh, XR of those two ciphertexts. So given L0, it's easy to find L0 prime uh, or vice versa. And it is um, also possible to solve even if you don't know anything about L0 or L0 prime. Uh, there are techniques for that. So that's the reason why two rounds of Feistel network uh, is not good. And I will show you a quick demo now. So the demo that we are going to see will help us to uh, appreciate the fact that um, if you do two rounds of Feistel network, as you can see here, I'm just doing a two rounds of Feistel network. And my data is, is a carefully constructed like this, right? I have, uh, I'm in, in, in hex, and zero x means hex. So I have like um, um, eight bytes of uh, uh, B, Right, that means I, need, I write 16 times. That's that's every two Bs correspond to one B in ASCII, and uh, <clears throat> the next data set is also same as the original data, except that I replace the first half by another, another. In the, all A's are replaced by C. Other than that, both data resemble the resemble the diagram that I drew on the whiteboard. Now I get ciphertext from the Feistel network. I get another ciphertext from the second Feistel network. Right. And I want to show to you that exhoring the two ciphertexts um, gives, gives detailed insights about exhoring the two plain texts. So as you can see, I, the first half of the ciphertext uh, is nothing but the first half of the XOR of the two data. So if you know one data, you can find the other data easily, right? How? Um, all you're going to do is say, uh, let me call this um, C XOR with C2, okay? is equal to, let's assume for a moment, is equal to um, D is a data, D XR with D2, right? And we know this data, this is public, XR of two ciphertexts is public. So let's call it C for a moment, and let's call it um, oh, uh, Y for a moment, okay? This is Y, is D XR D2. So let's say you also know about D, can you find D2 easily? Yes, all you have to do is Y XR of D will give you D2. That's the reason why two rounds of Feistel network is not good. As you can see, XRing this first half gives the same as XRing the first half of the data. Okay, I hope I convinced you that um, you have to follow the cryptographic recommendation. Um, minimum three rounds are needed for um, the Feistel network to be a pseudorandom permutation, but uh, you need at least four rounds for um, strong pseudorandom permutation. Strong means um, it's much harder for an attacker to break, uh, in, informally speaking, much harder to, to break um, the, the uh, PRP, the pseudorandom permutation. Okay, um, thank you very much uh, for your attention.